Luke chapter 5, verse 36. I might have said, uh, actually, it's 33. I'm trying to confuse you all this morning to make sure you're paying attention. Luke 5, verse 33. I'm happy to be in the house this morning. I hope you are too. And here's what God's word says to us. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise the disciples of the Pharisees. But thine eat and drink. And he said unto them, Can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. And then shall they fast in those days. And he spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of new garment uh, of a new garment upon an old, if otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent. And the piece that was taken out of the new gar- uh, of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles, and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, the old is better. Church, will you pray with me this morning? Father, I I echo the sentiments of the prayers that were lifted up in Sunday school and the prayers that were lifted up even as we open this service, Father. Father, I just have a, a, a heart and a spirit of thankfulness this morning that you continue to bless us. Father, that you bless me personally, my family, my family here at Grace in this ministry. Father, you you give us so much more than we are ever deserving of. Father, this morning I pray that as we go through your word, that we take time to self-reflect. Father, looking to you to correct us, not looking at this word as a as a way for us to dissect and and try to interpret what it is that you say, but rather relying upon the movement of the Holy Spirit to speak directly to our hearts. And Father, allow us to make decisions, help us, guide us in the way we should go when it comes to needing something new. Father, I just pray that if there be anyone in the house this morning or someone who might be watching along or may in the future who does not know you, will hear these words and, Father, repent of their sin and start following Jesus. Father, I pray for the backslidden Christian who may be in here this morning. Father, I pray that you convict their heart and show them the need for them to grow closer to you. Father, I pray for the one or the few in here this morning that are as spiritually close to you as they've ever been. Father, I pray that you strengthen and encourage them and also challenge them all the same to never become complacent in the position they're in, but instead have a deep desire and appetite to grow closer and closer to you. Father, I pray that everything that's said and done this morning we realize is only because of you. And Father, I pray that you just tarry with us a little while. And it's in Jesus' name I pray all of these things. Amen. Over the past three weeks, we've looked at questions regarding personal judgment and choice. We've talked about the content of your conversations. And we've looked at the criticism that you both give as well as receive. This week, though, not necessarily a part of that series which had a theme or that was heavily focused on personal evangelism... There are some more questions for you to ask yourself as we go through these scriptures in Luke chapter 5. For me, also, to ask myself. In seven days, we're going to begin a series of meetings that are labeled revival meetings. Though some may disagree and may even be a little unsettled by what I'm about to say, there is nothing that is special about quote-unquote revival meetings. Nothing. Nothing special about them at all. Because there are so many times that you and I treat the quote-unquote revival meeting as just a regular service. Now, what do I mean by 
regular worship service. What, what exactly do I mean by that? I mean the kind of service that you go to maybe once a week, once a month, once every couple of months, a couple of times a year. The kind of service where you come not expecting too much. Right? Not expecting anything of substance or value. Now with that mindset of not expecting much, that kind of mindset you can't blame on the appearance of a building or a sanctuary. Amen? You can't blame that on the quality, whether it being good or bad, of the music. You can't blame that on the affability or lack thereof of the preacher or the content of his sermon. None of those things can be blamed for the perspective of going to worship Jesus and not expecting much to happen. It becomes another line item on your weekly agenda. What does? When you treat worship methodically, even procedurally, or business-like, because then it lacks genuine worship of Christ. It lacks an openness to what God has in store for you. How many blessings do we miss because we are tunnel vision? How many blessings do we overlook because we're distracted by something else? When you and I come to worship Jesus, it should be done in a, in a manner where you are looking for guidance and wisdom, divine guidance and wisdom. You are looking for a renewal of faith. You are looking for a changed nature. Now that, that's scary. You mean when I come to, to worship Jesus, I should change? Absolutely. If we're worshiping Jesus, we should not be the same as we were previously. When you approach worship with this perspective, every single meeting can be a revival meeting. Amen? Every single one of them. What are the preconditions of a revival meeting? What exactly is required of the Christian? You see, we, we give these blanket statements and we even lift them up in prayers, both corporately like this or maybe even privately in our prayer closet. We lift up these, these blanket prayers of, we need revival. We need revival in our homes. We need revival in our schools. Put, put God back in school. We need revival in our government. We need revival in our country. Now, all of those sound great, right? That sounds uber spiritual. But what is required for that type of revival? I don't have the answer for you. But God does. Amen? Because in His Word in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, here's what God's Word tells us is required, is a precondition for revival. Here's what it says. If my people which are called by my name. Let's stop right there. We're not talking about the unsaved. We're not talking about the unchurched. We're talking about the faithful follower of God. My people called by my name shall humble themselves. Humble themselves in what? Go to church? No. Humble themselves and, and, and pay some, some money? No. Humble themselves and pray. Humble themselves and pray. Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I, I being God, I will hear them from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I hear a ton of, a ton of people talking about the state of, of our society, about how wretched it has become. And, and I agree with that sentiment. About the need for revival. Yet when I look at Second Chronicles, and I, I, I'll just talk about myself, I mean the formula is super simple for revival. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, 
Seek my face. Repent of sins. I will heal them. It seems so simple when it's there in black and white. Look, don't get me wrong. I love, absolutely love, as much as the next person, the preaching of the Jim McComases, of the, of the David Crows, of the, of the Derek Stennis, of the Curtis Linton, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Bobby Jacksons. I love them all as much as probably one of you do. But understand this, a traveling evangelist is not a biblical requirement for genuine revival. A special singer is not a biblical prerequisite for revival. A series of five consecutive church meetings is not a condition of actual, real revival. Real, attested, certifiable revival brings something alive again. After all, that's the definition of revival. It makes things new. To achieve that, you don't need evangelists, special singers, or a series of successive meetings. There is only one thing you need. And if you haven't heard anything up until now and you tune me out for the rest of this service, understand this. There is only one thing you need, and that is Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, There, if any man, or therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That new creature, that new man or, or woman, it becomes, or it comes rather, it's a direct result of Christ renewing your very nature. This does not happen instantaneously, by the way. Why? Because you will still struggle with the desires, the habits, and the limitations of your flesh. You can't get away from it. That is why the follower of Jesus needs renewing from time to time. Would you agree with me this morning that there are times in your walk with Christ you just need some, some renewing. You need something fresh. You need replenishment. Why? Because we are struggling. We struggle with this flesh every single day that's constantly battling us. George Whitefield said the renewal of our natures is a work of great importance. It is not to be done in a day. We have not only a new house to build up, but an old one to pull down. The title of the message this morning is Needing Something New. Needing Something New. There are three questions that you can ask yourself this morning, as it pertains to revival, because after all, revival meetings start next week, right? And it's amazing because in revival meetings, you see people come to the altar when they rarely come at all the rest of the time, right? You see people who, they don't care to even sing during the congregationals on Sunday morning, but boy, they got to get up front to sing during revival. Understand this, I'm not picking on anybody, because it's easy to get caught up in emotion. Amen? But what I'm asking you here this morning is if you need something new, if you truly need revival, or do you like the idea of revival? You like the pop, pomp in the circumstance, but not really the true meaning, the true drive of revival. On the heels of our message last week, which explained how someone will always make a fuss. <laughs> we have a bit of, a, bit of the same thing going on in our text this morning. As you read through Luke chapter 5, you will find the scribes and the Pharisees, and they're grumbling, right? They're, they're complaining, claiming Jesus to be a blasphemer 
trying to discredit him because he dined with sinners. Subsequently, we find in our text that the Pharisees are using questions as a form of protest. God's word says, Luke chapter 5, verse 33. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? Likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees. Man, those people, we have it, we have it down, right? All the old ways of doing things, this is, they, they have it together. That's what they're saying. But thine, Jesus' disciples, eat and drink. And he said unto them, and by the way, this, this, just, just to put this out here, this makes a, a big preacher's heart happy when we hear Jesus fighting against uh, fasting for a minute. I just want to put that out there real quick. Uh, man, a tough crowd this morning. And he said unto them, Can you make the children of the bride chamber fast? While the bridegroom is with them. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. And then shall they fast in those days. Now you might be saying, Danny, I don't understand. You're talking about revival. How do you get anything about revival from these scriptures? Well, give me a little bit and I'll tell you. The Pharisees' question to Jesus centered on the act of fasting. However... Inside of the dialogue between Jesus and the Pharisees, we can learn something about revival. The first question you can ask yourself this morning is, how have you personally, not the church, not your spouse, not the evangelist that's going to come, how have you personally prepared for revival? You see, the Pharisees thought that Jesus' disciples conducted themselves improperly. They were eating when the Pharisees thought it was inappropriate from a religious perspective. Jesus' Jesus's response is, when you're invited to a wedding and in the presence of the bride and the groom, are you not going to be joyful? Isn't there something to celebrate? Are you really not going to celebrate along with them? Are you not going to partake in the festivities, I don't know about you, but when you go to a wedding, you, you, you likely attend a reception where there's some sort of banquet or, or some sort of gathering after the ceremony, after the, after the time when they've married you. You're there to celebrate a union. Jesus was referring to himself as the bridegroom. His example of the bridegroom being taken away is a hint of the time when he would go to the cross and eventually leave this earth. Understand, Christian, this morning that if you long for revival, if you are in need of a renewing of your faith, if you need spiritual replenishment, then that means that you are not as close to the bridegroom as you once were. And that's a hard pill to swallow. You might have areas in your life where you're just, quite frankly, not allowing Jesus in. You may be thinking that you faithfully attend worship. You give your tithes and you may even serve in some capacity. And I understand why there are times, or rather, you can't understand why there are times when you feel like something is still amiss spiritually speaking. There are still times in your life, no matter, no matter how much you do, no matter how much you're involved, you still feel like something is missing. But understand that the word you read and hear, accompanied by divine guidance you receive, cannot be ignored nor, neglect, nor neglected. It's kind of like that scripture, huh? Be not just hearers of the word, but doers of it. God's Word tells us in the book of Hebrews, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now, let me, let me, let me try to explain here what, what, what I'm trying to get across. <clears throat> I remember going on vacation with, with my family, with Junior and Buffy and some others in 2010, and we got the privilege to, to go snorkeling. Now, Brother Ray, 
Snorkeling is not like scuba diving, okay? So stop picturing me in a wetsuit. I wore swim trunks and a shirt. <clears throat> we got the chance to go snorkeling. So, you know, I, if you ever get the opportunity to do that, you want to see God's creation, there's something amazing about it. Uh, it's, it. It's indescribable. And after that long flight, I hate to fly. We were off the coast of, of Kona, Hawaii, and I, I absolutely despise flying. I, I live a tough life, right? I'm sitting here complaining about flying to Hawaii. <clears throat> I'm thinking, you know what, I've paid this money, I'm never going to fly here again because I just, I know God made me without wings for a reason. And I'm going to get my money's worth. So if you think me snorkeling is funny, imagine my brother Junior in swim flippers and a pool noodle trying to snorkel, okay? But anyway, I go out into the water, and before I know it, I'm, I'm looking and I'm, I'm swimming and I'm just looking at the... the the wildlife, the, the sea life, and I'm looking at the, the aquatic vegetation underneath, and it's just, it's just a beautiful sight. And before long, in the midst of swimming through the waves and just enjoying what was going on, I, I, I popped back above the water, and I looked back, and everybody on the shore is now super, super small. Because in the midst of fighting the little bit of current that was there and just enjoying myself, I was drifting much further away than I realized. It wasn't intentional. It, it wasn't like I wasn't enjoying myself. I was having a ball. But I was very close to being a, in a precarious situation because although I can swim okay, I'm buoyant. Once you get in those waves and that current, unless you're a strong swimmer, depending on how it is, you, you're going to have a difficulty getting back. And... Everyone else was staying close to the shore. And like I said, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I'm, I'm going to keep going out, keep going out. Sooner or later, it was tough getting back in. I didn't intentionally do it. I didn't expect to turn around and see everybody so tiny. I was enjoying myself with little regard to safety or protocol. Because after, after all, they gave us rules that we should follow to make sure we stay safe. Who needs rules, Right? This even passive disregard for keeping a check on my surroundings could have put me in an even more dangerous situation because the longer I was out there, the further and further I drifted away from the shore. That can happen, Christian. That can happen spiritually too. You go along living life doing exactly what you think you ought to do. You're, you're enjoying it. Nothing, nothing too terrible seems to be going wrong. Things in life seem to be going pretty swimmingly. No pun intended. Everything seems to be doing all right. But if you're not careful, if you don't, if you, rather if you, if you disregard the rules, if you don't follow protocol, if you're not careful and you don't keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, you will drift away. It's unavoidable. Unfortunately, so many get so far from the spiritual shore, they think they might as well stay immersed in the world because it's far too difficult to swim back. Jesus was telling the Pharisees in our scripture that there would be a time when fasting was needed. There would be a time when, when God's people would long for Him. That is when He was not near. If you are wanting revival, if you are longing for revival, then you must realize that it is needed because you are not as near to God as you should be or that you would like to be. And guess what? When you find yourself in that situation, that means you need to prepare for it. You need to be ready. You need to make sure you're doing everything within your power to prepare for revival to take place. The question was, what have you done to prepare for revival? Have you prayed? Have you fasted? Have you taken worship seriously? Not say, oh, I'll, I'll wait and I'll be, I'll be real serious about worshiping Jesus after I hear Jim McComas preach or whomever. Have you taken worship seriously? Have you diligently studied the Word of God? If you long for revival, then I ask you, what have you done to prepare for it? 
Because it takes more than making a mental note or putting, putting that date in your calendar that a revival meeting is going to take place. It takes preparation. Let's continue reading in God's Word. Luke chapter 5, verse 36. And he spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of new garment upon an old. I'm going to stop right there. If you grew up like we grew up, that's not true. When our jeans were wearing out in the knees or something like that, I was quick to get a patch on my knee. Let's keep going. I'm not contradicting the word of God. We're going somewhere with this. Then both the new maketh a rent, that means maketh a tear, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeth not with the old. They don't match. Right? You ever see when you, when you patched your, your jeans, well, there was one piece that was always darker than the rest, and everybody knew you got patched? Maybe it's just me. And no man putteth away, or putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles, and be spilled, and bottles shall perish. I told Crystal last night, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to talk about fermenting wine in a teetotaling church. Be ready to vote me out. The second question I have for you this morning, or rather that you can ask yourself this morning, are you satisfied with your current status? So the first question is, are you preparing for revival? The second is, are you happy? Are you satisfied with where you're at right now? In the text, Jesus is explaining to the Pharisees that he was not there to add or to augment Judaism. Jesus was not there to teach them how to rely even more heavily on their ritualism, selective rigidness to the observance of the law, or to their legalism. Theologian Jack Deere wrote this, The essence of legalism is trusting in the religious activity rather than trusting in God. Believe me, folks, this is not a thing of the distant past. There are many modern Christians right now who are more trusting in religious activities than they are in trusting the Creator of the universe. It is putting our confidence in a practice rather than in a person. And without fail, this will lead us to love the practice more than the person. That person is Jesus Christ. Jesus was explaining that a simple patching of their practices would not do. The practice of fasting in itself would not make a difference. It is the trust, hope, and sureness of God to deliver you no matter what the situation you're in. That's what makes the difference. You see, the Pharisees were okay with their religion and their religiosity. They likely saw areas where the practices of Judaism were needed improvement in some form or fashion. They were okay with their ritualism. Perhaps they just wanted Jesus to add to these actions, which centered on what they could do right, or what they could do to be right with God, instead of relying on God to make up the difference. So Christian, this morning I ask you again, are you satisfied with your current status. See, they were satisfied with their current status. They were fine with relying upon themselves and their ability to offer the proper sacrifices at the right time to be reconciled with God. How about you? Are you satisfied with where you're at spiritually? You might say, Danny, I'm not satisfied with members of my family or the relationships I have with others. You might think I'm not satisfied with my health. You might think I'm not satisfied with my job. You might think I'm not satisfied with my paycheck. I'm not satisfied with the weather. I'm not satisfied with my marriage. I'm not satisfied with my children. I'm not satisfied with my government. I am not satisfied with the people I worship with. You might not be satisfied with what is considered appropriate dress in today's society. You might not be satisfied with the conduct or the speech of the youth, and so forth and so on. So much debate was made about a halftime show for the Super Bowl, and you hear crickets about the millions murdered for abortion. 
you hear crickets about the fact that the rate of divorce in Christian marriages are just as high as they are in secular marriages. Crickets on all of those things, yet we want to be close to God. You might think you're not satisfied in all those things, but all of those things that I just mentioned plays second fiddle to the question, are you satisfied with your current spiritual status? The Apostle Paul comes to mind, and I shared this thought a while back, but Paul wrote in his letters to the Christians at Philippi, here's what he said, he said, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. This was Paul's words led by the Holy Spirit naturally in the book of Philippians. When it comes to things of this world, the Apostle Paul talks about being content with them. Jobs, economic status, health, possessions, all of these things. Paul wrote in Timothy, 1 Timothy, but godliness with contentment is great gain. With earthly possessions earthly relationships. So when it came to the physical aspects of this life, Paul, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, gave the advice of being content in all things. Understand this. Except for one. There's one thing that he was not going to be content with and the follower of Jesus Christ should never be content with. In Philippians, still the same, chapter 3, verse 14, you might know it. He wrote a press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The Christian should constantly be striving for closeness with Christ. Relying upon Him instead of your own abilities. The old garment in Jesus' parable is a metaphor for your old self. Reoccurrently, the follower of Christ reaches periods in life where there is something that is dissatisfying. It is those times when you go before the Lord and you ask Him to aid you. But that is the equivalent of asking Jesus to put a patch on something. And if you ever want to hear what I'm talking about, think about most of the prayer requests you hear. And I'm not picking on prayer. We need to pray to God for everything. Pray without ceasing. That's what His Word says, not mine. But if you hear the prayers on the hearts of the average Christian, they're asking for patches. Not something new. Patch this up for me, God. There's a hole in my garment. My poor mother-in-law, every time she walks through the door, Wyatt looks for places in his little blue blanket that he has for her to patch up, for her to sew up when she gets there. And a lot of times, as Christians, that's what we do to God. God, I have this hole, and I need you to sew it up for me. Jesus just fixed this one spot. I like the rest. Instead of just realizing and going before Him and praying, explaining that you need Him, not just where that hole is, but in every aspect of your life. So many times the Christian's life becomes, let's be honest, it becomes an open wound. A bullet hole, if you will. And if you hear the average prayer that is asked of Jesus by the follower of Christ, it's to put a band-aid on that bullet wound instead of asking for the entire healing of your spirit, your body, and your mind. Not asking just for you to sew up that piece of the garment, but asking for a whole new garment. Just as Paul explained, he was pressing toward the mark. Christian, if you are honest this morning, you need help not just trying to reach the mark, but even keeping focus on the mark. Keeping Jesus within your sight. Not getting distracted by the things around you. Not being overcome with emotion because of things you may be dissatisfied with or even satisfied with. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you should be content. I should be content from a physical standpoint. 
But you must never grow weary in asking God to continue to shape and mold you into what He wants you to be, not what we desire to be. You should never be content with being stagnant in your relationship or or in relation to your closeness with Christ. Continuing in Luke chapter 5, verse 38, God's Word says this, But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also, having drunk old wine straightway, desireth new, for he saith, the old is better. The third question you can ask yourself is this. First, you ask, how have you prepared for revival? Second, you ask, are you happy? Are you satisfied with your current status? The third question, are you ready for something new? Are you ready for something new? Going back to Jesus' parable here in the text for a moment, he's explaining the need for new wine to go into new bottles. And the word bottle here can be translated as wineskins. As a matter of fact, if you, if you look at a more modern translation, you'll see bottles will be, will be changed for wineskins. Wineskins were made from some sort of animal skin and had the primary purpose of storing or transporting liquids. And the reason you need to put new wine into new wine skins was because new wine expanded as it fermented. It grew once it got into the pouch. It would stretch, the new wine skin would stretch as the new wine swelled. But the old wine skins, the old bottles, they were fixed in their position. There was no stretching. There was no expanding. They would not expand as new wine or a new, not a new wine skin would. The same thing can happen to the follower of Jesus Christ. You can become fixed in your ways which prevents you from growing in your faith. It prevents you from serving in the capacity which God has called you to. It prevents you from real revival because of your resistance to being reshaped from branching out and from growing. And why? Because like that old wineskin, you can become stuck in your old ways, saying or rather being unwilling to allow Jesus to be your Lord completely and watching His plan for you unfold in front of your very eyes. God, I am fine in every area, but please help me from this relationship perspective, this economical perspective, this health perspective. Leave everything else alone, but fix this one thing for me. God, please. Just this one thing, and the rest is good. Your old way, my old way, our current way, is comfortable. It's what we know. It's what we're used to. It doesn't challenge us. It doesn't cause us to change our actions. It doesn't cause us to self-reflect. It doesn't cause ourselves to look in the mirror and say, you know what, in this area, Danny, you're, you're screwing up. The old way is comfortable. Just like that old wine skin that won't budge, too many Christians become content with how things are and are opposed to God challenging, changing, converting, cultivating anything new. That mentality, that mentality alone, hinders sincere, authentic, and life-changing revival. Folks, I don't know about you, but there are plenty of times when I go to God and I ask for something. I, I, I need something new. I need something different to happen because what's, what's going on isn't working. Not a new possession, not a, not a new place to worship, not a new city to live in, but a new outlook, a fresh perspective, a renewed worship, renewed desire to serve, to give, to follow. There are times, understand, I get it. There are times when life beats you down. When health fails, when people disappoint you. 
when you know you should be more faithful to God, when you feel like everything is going wrong, when you just need something new, something different. In relation to Jesus' parable, it's time for that new garment. It's time for that new bottle. It's time for genuine revival. I'll close with this. Warren Rearsby wrote, There are no shortcuts when it comes to revival. The church desperately needs revival. But it is not going to come quick and by easy methods. Evan Roberts prayed for 11 years before the Welsh revival broke out and his ministry during that remarkable time broke him physically. That means he sacrificed something personal to see revival or to be a part of God's divine plan for revival to take place in God's people. More than 100,000 people were converted to Christ during that mighty awakening, but it was not the result of manufactured meetings. In fact, most of them, if you read about it, came about spontaneously. Or man-made promotions. True revival. Real revival. Authentic revival. is far much more deeper than that. I shared the verse with Second Chronicles during the introduction of this message. And it gave you and it gave me almost step-by-step instructions on preparing for revival. On preparing for something new. And guys, we got to want it if we want it to happen. Now, if we just want, as a church, if we, if we just want a traveling evangelist to come, we can do that. And that's, we're, we are doing that, as a matter of fact, in seven days. <clears throat> we can do that. We're going to hear some good music, right? We hear some good messages. Brother Jim can preach. And we can do all those things. And on Monday morning, we can go back to living like we did. Come back Monday night, hopefully. We'll hear it again. And we'll get that emotional response over and over again till Wednesday. But then Thursday will come. And did anything change? I'll never forget. I was so excited. I forget, it was a few years back now. And it hurt my feelings then, but now, now I know it was probably one of the greatest questions I was ever asked personally. A few years back, John asked me to preach revival here in the fall. And I was super excited. I, I, just, I, I, was, I was ecstatic because, see, in my, in my view, what I desire to do is, is to be a traveling evangelist. That was my desire. God had other plans, obviously. I preached that revival and I saw people that I don't normally see come to the altar, come to the altar. And I saw, I saw people make some, some commitments to God. And then someone came and asked me this question. Do you think real revival took place? And that broke me for a minute. It hurt my feelings. What do you mean? Was, was my preaching not good enough? But I let that sit with me for a week, two weeks, three weeks, six months. And now a few years. And those people that made those commitments, most of them aren't even in this room this morning. Those people who prayed those things, well, they're, they're still struggling with those same things. And I'm not picking on those people for praying to God. Good for them. But how many times do we treat revivals like regular worship and give emotional responses when what we really need is for God to give us something new? And I don't know about you, I can be as close as I ever thought that I could ever be to God. And I still look at my life and say, God, I think I have it all down right now, but I know in this perspective, in this situation, I need something new. I don't need just a patch. I need a new garment. If you long for revival to happen, God's Word gives us exactly what it is we need to do. In 2 Chronicles Step-by-step instructions on preparing for revival. The first way, the first thing, is to humble yourself. Humble myself. Secondly, is to pray. And there's no better time to pray for revival. Not revival to happen in a week, but for revival to happen now. For a fresh perspective to be given to us every day. 
waking up every day. God has blessed us with a new day. And hopefully, maybe even, a new garment.